We are currently experiencing the worst skills gap we have ever seen. Less people are coming into the trade than ever before and less experienced machinists are out there to train them. Which brings us to the question, how do we train new machinists properly? What's up guys, Ian Sandusky back here again for Shop Talk. Today we're gonna to be answering that question, but before we do, make sure you like and subscribe below if you wanna see more videos. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so today on Shop Talk, we're gonna be diving back into the Practical Machinist forums. Um, for those of you who haven't seen one of these videos where we go into the Practical Machinist forums before, we like to go on there and take a look at some of the threads that we find interesting. Um, if you guys haven't been on the Practical Machinist forums before, I highly recommend it. Um, there's a lot of great information there, so make sure you go check it out for yourself. The one that caught my eye this week is it relates to the question and the, uh, the topics we've been talking about lately, you know, with what's going on in the trade. Um, you know, how do we keep people in the trade? How do we keep people leaving the trade for, you know, some opportunities right now that are paying more than being a machinist? And this one caught my eye because it was put forward by a guy who came on and was having a problem with training staff. So from what I understood, this guy has a small shop he has, it sounds like between five and 10 people total on the floor. Um, from the way he broke it down, and I'm gonna, we're gonna link the, uh, the thread below here so you can see for yourself in case I miss anything. But from what I could see, you know, his longest guy I believe had been there for about eight years. He had another guy that had been there for a few years. And then besides that, he had hired on some new people over the last two years that may be completely new to the trade. Um, so they may have come on as operators or, you know, laborers and he's trying to face the question of how do we train them into machinists the problems he was experiencing he said was that because he is a small shop you know his margins are fairly tight um, because he only has a couple of guys who have experience he has been trying to streamline his shop as much as possible so he said that he is experiencing problems that not only is he having trouble training these people but things are going wrong um, he related a scenario where he came in after a Saturday where he hadn't been there and some guys had come in and I believe the part run was about 70 parts and he said that 50 of them were scrap. And he went and looked at another machine and the fixture plate, which he had built for it at you know, a high price, was damaged. And then he went over and I believe he said, you know, every day, oh, he had um, some tooling. He had some, uh, you know, feed mills or expensive facing tooling with insert insertable carbide inserts. And he went and looked at that and all the screws were stripped out of it. Problems that seem like they should be things people are catching, problems that seem like they should be things that shouldn't be happening consistently. And every day he said, it seems like something's going wrong. Um, you know, he gave the anecdote that if he had just given everybody the day off instead of actually having guys come in that day, he probably would have been in the same situation, if not better, than had they worked because you know there was so much of a money loss between fixing the fixture. You know, if you've ever stripped out screws from a you know expensive piece of tooling, that piece of tooling may never be the same again. Um, you know, you can't just helicoil a face mill. Um, even just drilling out screws from a face mill takes time. So he was voicing this frustration and saying, you know. He tries to do everything he can to make it good on his guys. He related that, you know, he, ha he goes through and engraves all his fixture plates with part numbers and program numbers. Um, he said that he does his best to have all his programs very well organized and, you know, keeping on top of where guys should find those programs. Um, clearly labeling everything possible. And his frustration was he feels like he's doing all these things. And at this point, just, it's not working. Um, he feels like if he tries to idiot proof it anymore, these guys aren't gonna be learning. He can't just hold hands all day because these guys need to be able to learn. So that was kind of the scenario and the question he put forward and it's one that you know definitely exists. I feel like I've been in this scenario before. I think every guy who's worked at a shop for any length of time will feel like they've had weeks where everything goes wrong. Um, and when it relates to training, this really is an interesting scenario. So there was one guy on there, I just wanna make sure I get his name right. It was T. Trager. He had some very, very good advice for this. And I'm just gonna kind of relate it to you and kind of comment on it myself. But he went through and kind of picked apart what was going on here and gave some advice I thought was absolutely incredible. And when he said, he kind of broke it down in by point. So his first point was, 
in order to make sure your guys are learning, you need to make sure you were setting a consistent leadership example. And what I interpreted from that is, as a guy who's been in the trade for a long time, um, you know, maybe not as long as some of you guys, but especially when you've been in the trade for a long time, when you're setting up a machine, when you're programming something, um, you know, when you're reloading something, you've been doing it long enough that you can kind of skip steps. Um, you know, maybe you don't go through and verify all your programs every single time. Maybe you don't go through every single menu when you're programming something in a cam system. Um, you know, maybe you check the important parts when a part comes off the machine, but you don't go through and check every single dimension because you've been doing this long enough that you know if these two dimensions are right, this one should be right. I'm not saying it's a good habit, but these things tend to happen. The problem is if you're training guys who are coming into the trade and that's all you're showing them and you're saying, oh, make sure you do this, but then, you know, as they're shadowing you, you're not doing that, they're not going to either. Um, if you don't find things important or you know illustrate that they're important, guys who are learning under you also aren't gonna think they're important. They're gonna say, oh, well, you know, I know I'm supposed to check the height on this tool every 10 parts because it tends to pull out. But do you know what? Jamie who runs that machine, yeah, he doesn't do it either. So it'll be fine. This is how mistakes happen. Um, you wanna make sure you are instilling the correct habits immediately into people because it's a lot easier to build a good habit than break a bad habit and start from, you know, and then try to build it back up into a good habit. It's, it's way easier to make sure you build that foundation correctly the first time. Um, the second one was identifying gaps in your training isn't enough. You need to be able to target it at the root. So what this guy was kind of saying and the way I interpret it is that it comes from an environment where people can come to you and tell you what actually went wrong. Um, you know, instead of the symptom, you know, we know this part came out wrong. You need to have an environment where guys can have open conversations with you and be honest about why that part went wrong. Um, if you have a shop environment, whether you are a senior machinist, whether you are training somebody, where, whether you are a shop owner, you need to be able to have those guys come to you and be honest about why something went wrong. If they just throw up their hands and say, oh, I don't know, maybe that's true, but generally, you know, if you've been doing this for even a couple months, you can generally identify where something went wrong. And sometimes that's because I forgot to tighten the screw or I got distracted talking to somebody and I didn't realize that machine was making a terrible sound. Being able to identify correctly at the root why that issue happened is the only way to fix it. Um, identifying it secondly properly is important. So, you know, is it actually a lack of skill in an area? So has that guy not been trained properly on how to go and program G code? Um, has that guy not been trained properly on how to sharpen a drill by hand and so the drill is wandering? Is there too much distraction on the floor? Are guys talking to each other too much and working too little? Um, you know, do you have the music cranked too loud in your shop because, you know, guys like it, but then they can't hear what's going on in the machine. Being able to identify that correctly and figure out what the real issue is as opposed to part is wrong, that's the only way you can really fix these issues and be able to train it. Once you've identified that, the third step is go over it with them providing not only guidance, but corrective action. Um, it's very easy to go to a guy who's made a mistake and say, don't do that again, or you know, watch this. That doesn't actually give them any guidance. In order to train them, you need to give them corrective action. So let's say, for example, we have a problem where a part is coming out all over the map. Um, the tolerances are wandering, we can't figure out why. You end up figuring out, you know, through this process, that it's because the guy is resetting the height offset every three times for some reason because he's afraid of that um, tool, you know, moving in the, uh, in the tool holder. Well, he shouldn't be doing that. So what's the corrective action in that case? Make sure you are measuring the tool in your presetter and then using it until, you know, and then checking the part. It's identifying where the issue is and giving them the corrective action to fix it. In concrete terms, um, guys, you know, I've said this before, people are not mind readers. You need to be able to tell them in very plain terms exactly what to do. Otherwise, it's not gonna get fixed. You're gonna keep fighting that same issue over and over again. Once you've done that, and it's very important next, and this is kind of the fourth point, is to document it. I think a lot of us are very, very good at documenting, you know, our profit margins or documenting our first off sheets and stuff. 
One thing I feel we all could do a lot better on, unless you have some kind of Kaizen system or whatever that black belt system is, is documenting where things go wrong. Um, I know I don't do it enough and I need to do it more. And this was a very, very good point this guy made. If you can actually document dates and reasons and machines and all the information you can about when things go wrong, you can identify patterns, you can identify you know, why things are going wrong, and then you can fix them. So this guy recommended, and I'm gonna start doing this myself as well, I thought this was brilliant. The same way you do a, uh, a process sheet, have one of those in Excel or whatever ERP system or you know, shop management system you're using, have a spreadsheet, have the dates, have the issue, have the operator, have the program, have the part. List it all out with a quick comment about what goes wrong and when. It's important not to put too much information into this at the point that it becomes unmanageable. You know, we've done sheets before where you have a sheet of paper when something goes wrong, it gets filed, it goes off in a filing cabinet. That's not a manageable solution. A manageable solution in this is having all the information there quickly, so A, you'll update it properly, and B, you can go back and look at it without having to go dig through a filing cabinet. Uh, I thought that was brilliant because I can't tell you how many times I've had you know one part go wrong. We don't get that part for another year. We experience the same issue, or you know every third run of this part go, goes wrong. We can't figure out why. We figure it out. We fix it. But then by the time we do it again, we don't remember what went wrong. Um, proper docu proper documentation regarding this is going to be critical because then you can actually train your guys. Hey, here's to look at what to look out for when this part comes up. Um, you know, it really helps keep them on top of things and keeps you on top of things. After that, the fifth point was to evaluate. So after you've done all this corrective action, you've gone through and tried to make things work a little better, it's to evaluate where you can do better. Um, do you have, you know, if we have bins on the shelf with all our part numbers on them. So for recurring jobs, you go grab the bin, you work with it that way. It has your setup sheet, it has all that kind of stuff. I need to make sure if I'm still having issues that I have proper information everywhere it needs to be. You know, we all try to avoid hand holding too much so that guys can actually learn, but there is a point where you need to make sure that I'm giving the guys all the resources and information they need for each job for it to go correctly. Um, if I'm not providing them with the right tooling, with the right measurement equipment, um, you know, if I don't have proper gauging and I'm just expecting them to be able to measure everything correctly instead of using a gauge where that may work better. I need to evaluate whether I need to invest in that. And that's important because if my guys are not given the resources they need to succeed, I can't turn around and blame that on training because that's a me issue, that's not a them issue. The last one was consistency versus trying to fix everything at once. Um, when weeks like this happen, like this guy described, where it seems like everything goes wrong, we often can feel like we need your reaction and we need to go fix everything at once. Um, you know, let's overhaul this whole shop, let's get a quality manager in here. We're gonna start 10 new processes. Because guess what guys, if you start everything at once and try to fix everything at once and overhaul everything, typically none of that's gonna stick. Um, I can't tell you how many times over the years we've tried to implement different things, big, big things. And because we were trying to do too much at once, we were right back where we started within six months because it's just too much to stay on top of. Um, consistency and trying to fix things as they come up trying to solve one issue at a time is really gonna be key because then it gets worked into your process as opposed to try, trying to start from zero and overhaul everything at once. That was the information this guy gave. I thought it was excellent, so make sure you go check it out. I might have missed something. The things I would add personally are process sheets. Guys, if you do not have process sheets, I highly recommend them. Um, literally just a sheet for every job with the program number, the part number, and the steps to set it up. Go get these jaws. Um, you know, that should be labeled. Go get this tooling specifically. You can give them the part number so they can go grab the case. Use this holder. Um, if you're the guy that programmed this or you're the guy that set it up the first time, make sure you have somewhere where someone who has never run this before could go grab it and do it themselves. Um, you know, I don't know how often this happens in your shop, but for a long time we had it, oh, this part's in? Well, go see that guy. He's the guy that does it. Oh, that guy's not here today? Well, we can probably figure it out doesn't work that way. You wanna make sure that anybody can go grab that sheet, figure it out on their own. Really, really helpful. Um, also, the other point I wanted to make, guys, was proper supervision and making sure you are actually supervising guys on the floor is key. And I don't mean hand-holding them. I don't mean being a micromanager. It sounded to me like this guy was kind of throwing new guys on the floor and just saying, go. 
um, you know, this trade has an apprenticeship for a reason. You need to make sure you're giving guys proper supervision, not to make sure that they are not slacking off on me and that too, but really to make sure that they are feeling supported, that they are not just, you know, flapping in the wind, trying to figure out what's going on. It's important to make sure that you are giving them enough guidance that you can't get mad at them when they come to you after being left alone for two days and have a run of bad parts. Um, I think this is really important, guys. You know, we do, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, have a huge, huge problem right now with not enough guys coming into the trade. Uh, we really, really, really need to focus on training guys up as quickly as possible and properly. Otherwise, we are gonna end up in five years with, you know, once the old guys get out of the trade, we're gonna have nobody on top who knows what they're doing and that's gonna be a huge, huge problem. So making sure we are getting these systems in-house properly the first time to train guys up is gonna be critical, not just for your shop, but for the trade in general. Okay guys, in the comments below, I wanna know some of the best things that you would put forward about training. Um, whether that's how the apprenticeship program works in your shop, whether it's tips that you give to guys you you know who are job shadowing you on the floor, or whether it was something bad that people, you know, a way that train people tried to train you in the past that didn't work. I love to hear them in the comments below, so make sure you post those below. Thank you very much for watching, guys. As always, make sure you like and subscribe below if you want to see more videos. You take care.